Hari, it's so nice to talk to you. Thanks for joining me. It's very nice to talk to you, Soledad. Thanks for having me. You bet. Um, you've been a person I've admired for a long time, and here's why. Um, you talk a lot about identity, and I think often uh, people whose parents are immigrants, right, we're always asked about identity, and some people have these thoughtful answers, and I, I literally write them down. I'm like, oh, shit, I got to say this next time I'm asked, because it's like an important, thoughtful identity immigrants the american dream it all makes sense yeah, and then yeah. other people are like blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm the blah, blah, blah. like i know i'm trying to say something thoughtful and i can't but you get asked it a lot because a lot of your work is around representation i yeah. you know i feel like representation with a capital r identity right. with a capital i right. and and you navigate them really well is this a thing that you have been thinking about your whole life? Is it only when you started sort of creating that people can, kind of came back and, and asked you? Or did you grow up thinking this way? I mean, let me first say that the fact you knew who I was and liked my work already is like, OK, all right, let me take that in. So thank you. I was mangling um, your name. I won't lie. Just a mangle. <laughs> nothing like you actually say it. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I grew up in, in, in Queens, New York. So I'm, you know, immediately confronted with so much diversity, like racial diversity, cultural diversity, religious diversity, people who are immigrants, people who've been there for generations, people who have papers, people who don't. And that's that's just what New York is, and particularly Queens and particularly Jackson Heights, where I grew up for, for a stretch. So that was like my day to day norm. But like any other kid, I'm watching tons of television. I'm watching films. I'm taking in the world um, through through mass media and you're watching mass media and you realize, oh, I don't exist in this space and the people I know don't exist in this space like we don't count. So even if you feel like, well, I have an immigrant community, I, I, I'm in New York, I'm surrounded by different brown people, I'm surrounded by my specific kind of brown people. Um, you, you get a sense that in rest of the country or as a whole, you are less than I mean, that's just that's just obvious. And then so, you know, you try to relate to mainstream white America, you you hear their stories and you're like, well, I, this is not the same as my story, but I can figure it out. OK, I'm, I'm a teenager. I have angst. I get it right. Like you, you, you find a way and sometimes you even end up idolizing that, that and hating yourself. Right. So there's there's that I think we all kind of have some experiences with identity and, and, and representation just through being a young person growing up and seeing what the media says is normal. And you complicate that with gender, you complicate that with sexuality, you complicate that with race, you complicate that with any number of things. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's a little harder to brush off, right? You, you can't just like, well, I, I grew up, it's over, I'm not dealing with it anymore. I think for me, you know, it got even more intense when I went to college in Maine, because now you're going from the most diverse place in the world to Maine. And, you know, they, there's a sign when you enter Maine, it says Maine, the way life should be. <laughs> and it, it, it's weird once you spend time in Maine because you're like cold and white. Like, why is this? <laughs> why is this the sign? It sounds a little, a little, you know, third Reiki. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very, that, that abrupt feeling of now I'm dealing with people who might not know Indian people, middle-class Indian people from cities and not, you know, from affluent suburbs or who went to private school, you know, I'm talking about students. And then you have the town outside. Do you know people that look like me? And you're just basing it on representations which were minimal at that point, right? You had, in 2000, which does, I guess that is 20 years now, but you had Apu from The Simpsons, Harold and Kumar had just come out and was seen as groundbreaking, even though it's just a weed movie. But people were amazed that we smoked weed too, I guess, uh, even though we invented it, which I think it should be noted. Um, <laughs> and so like, for me, it's like, well, I had no choice but to confront it. And then when I started doing comedy, it's like, you know, initially I'm talking about race and representation by play, not even playing with stereotypes, but using them because I knew that was that form of representation was effective for comedy. And as I got more critical, particularly after 9-11, and I saw how 
our images were used and, and exploited brown people in order to stoke fear. Uh, and I saw people getting deported and detained. And I saw the coverage of, of the other in that setting, uh, which is embarrassing that it took something closer to me to, to, to feel it as opposed to like, I don't know, the history of racism in this country versus black people or <clears throat> against indigenous people. I mean, look, I mean, granted, I was 18 or 19 at the time, so I had some growth, but um, certainly like that hit me. And, and I think from that, from that, those childhood experiences through college, 9-11 forward, I think representation and more important than representation is the is how that impacts how people treat you and view you. The representation is one thing. It's it, the more important part is how does this lead to me being treated by my peers, by employers, by professors, by people I love? Like, how does that impact them and then impact me? So that's a that's like a 10 part answer to a one part question. So I apologize. Yeah, but it, but. No, it's because the answers are always have to be in 10 parts, right? That's the which is I, why I find it so interesting when people of color are in comedy, because sometimes these answers are like so deep and you're like, yeah. wow, that's really intense and stressful and not right. funny, like not funny at all. Well, right, um, right. But for comedy, you, you just cut it down. You cut the fat out and just do the punchlines. Then if you write a book or do a, a, a one man show, a solo show, then you you tell the sad part of it and not just the punchline. When I was growing up in Long Island, I remember, I think the first time it really clued me in how people sort of felt about me um, was when uh, people would talk about the reason they left New York City. Huh. And it was, and, and they made it really clear, like in where I was from, which is about an hour and 45 minutes. I was out from a town called Smithtown. Um, oh, super, super what, where, um, what county is it? Is that Suffolk? It's uh, Suffolk County, North yeah. Shore, yeah. near Stony Brook University. My dad was a professor at Stony Brook. And I remember people would talk very clearly about, like, we had to leave because these people were moving in. You know, and the people were obviously... You know, they didn't say it, but they were the brown people were moving like it was these people were coming in and devaluing, yeah. you know, where we were living in New York. And so it, it kind of it kind of fucked up New York for us. So we had yeah, to come yeah, out yeah. to the and it really took me a minute before I realized like, oh, they're talking. My parents did the reverse commute. We moved out to Manhattan. Um, I grew wow. up in Long Island, but they always loved Manhattan. So they would kind of go back in. So they were just like the opposite of everything all the time. But it was such a weird thing to be the only right and i always felt like there was this pressure to um to do two things one if there was any other black person you would have to date them not that i was allowed to date at all but like everyone <laughs> would assume that you were gonna somehow right. find your way together. i would hate that it's like dating through like color matching like it was as simple only, as that like three of you in the entire school right so it's like oh i guess and then the second thing was you, you had to kind of be the opposite of what everybody would expect right because mm. you know it sized you up and you kind of felt like you had this mantle of oh i'm not that we're this over here when everybody's you know you're whatever eighth grade and it's so it's just i find it so um it's just a lot, you know, it's just it's that's that's the why it has to be the 10 part answer, because it's just uh, it's just saddled with so much crap sometimes that I, I find I'm always amazed that immigrants are so um, patriotic. I know that's not like what we're known for, but but right. actually we are. Um, and they, when they chose to be America, here. Sometimes America doesn't really love you back. You right. know? And, and yet if, um, uh, immigrants are so patriotic, uh, so patriotic. And that has always kind of both inspired me and kind of broken my heart, too, a little bit. Oh, yeah. Like the people that like, you know, I feel like so many of us, even uh, for me, I'll say so many of my friends uh, on the left will say, like, I'm embarrassed to be American. I wish I wasn't American. I'm going to leave. And I, I just think about, God, what a privilege to say that. Do you know and what I mean? And they're not really leaving. <laughs> they're not, no, they're not going to they're not going to leave. And first of all, I mean, I've said this before, but Canada doesn't have a special visa for American liberal cowards like that's not <laughs> you can't just go to a place and stay there. Like, I think our immigration system has proven that there are potentially repercussions for that, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's very easy to say that but for people who struggle who go through so much to be here. I mean, in, in some ways, I feel like the most patriotic, uh, patriotic people 
are the people who had to cross a desert and who had to suffer and go through like it's so weird like you have to get in the right way and then it, you know perhaps if you if we have this new policy then you have to wait this more this many more years before you get this paperwork and that it's like they crossed a desert they had to deal with coyotes they lost all their money they're indigenous they don't even speak spanish right and you're telling them they got through that whole obstacle course Plus, they got past the U.S. Border Patrol, which is already really difficult. They did all that, and you're telling them that they can't, like, stay? Like, to me, that's, like, the ultimate, like, dedication to a place. We, I was just born here. It's not even my struggle. Like, I'm getting credit off my parents' struggle. I was just born here. But if you're an undocumented person who had to go through hell to get here... Of course you should, should you should stay. You won. You finished the obstacle course. That is the real challenge. What is your reaction to Kamala Harris? Because I know at this moment everybody's like, depending on who they are, right? Sure. So, um, it, God forbid, I'm saying this jokingly, so that all my you know sorors, my sorority don't freak out because she's in a, the opposite sorority, and we're like, oh, those those sorors are gonna have the biggest head. But like, like they they have one take, which is you know she is us, and they've backed her heavily. And then you have if you gone to Howard, that's a whole other thing. And right. then there's a like, black women contingent, which is a whole other thing. And and I would think also like a Southeast Asian contingent of you know Kamala's us, and it's kind of cool that everybody's claiming her. Um, do you claim, how, how, tell me about that. Like, how do you feel about that? You know, it, it, it's funny. You know, I knew she was half Indian, not only just half Indian, half South Indian, which as a South Indian it is a big deal. And yet it didn't really, once she was chosen as the vice president, as, as Biden's running mate, then all of a sudden I, I heard this outpouring of excitement. The fact that we're, we might have the first South Asian female vice president, South Asian vice president at all. But 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 it's funny, like it didn't even hit me, really. It didn't even it, it's almost like and, and I was trying to figure out why like that, because that should be a story. We're a small community where I don't even think we're one percent of the American population, one percent at the most. This should be huge for us. This is something that should have been talked about when she was running for president. Mm -hmm. When even when she was, you know, uh, you know, prosecutor, district attorney in, in in California, that is somebody like we should be like, oh, my God, she made it. And I've thought a lot. Why is it? Is it because she's a woman? Is it because, you know. I mean, I think that the answer, I know the answer. I don't know why I'm asking. I think it's because she's half black. Meaning that it doesn't count or I feel that like there's so much count? there's so much racism. I think people, when they think about racism, they people think about it as like white people being racist, but like the whole system is racist. And so, you know, this whole idea of being the model minority and fitting in this place where um, you're you're never going to be fully American because you're not white or black, but you're higher than black people because, you know, they screw everything up and you did everything right. You know, that there's there's that weird place that Asians in general, you know, are forced to play. But a lot of us buy into that, into the, the fear of black people. We take culture. We gladly co-opt hip hop. We gladly like everybody co-ops fair, fair, really but do. there's a fair. But at the same time, there's something to be said about doing that, but also co-opting some of the struggle of it. Because, look, our struggle as South Asians initially, primarily, was in another place. It was from a colonial oppressor. It was a, it was a different, that was only, what, like one generation past us? It's a completely different thing. And now we're in this country, and it's not that we're not being oppressed, that we're not dealing with stuff, but what do we have here to draw from? Who gives us strength? And it's, it's black people and black culture. And so we're glad to, to do that, but at the same time, I can't tell you the number, particularly of like Indian Hindu families who will say things like to, to their children, you know, before they, they find, you know, like when they're younger, look for when you get married, when you, you date, not even dating, there's marriage. You know, I don't know how it is now, but back then it was just marriage. It's 
no black, no Muslim. Very clear. No black, no Muslim. It that I mean, it's disgusting. And it's not to say that there isn't also, you know, prejudice the other way, I'm, you know, like from black folks towards brown folks. Sure. But there's something about the fact that we're considered these model minorities and we we take on this this racism. It's as if it, it came with the starter kit when you <laughs> migrate to this country. Anti-black racism is is part of the deal. This is where you get your green card. You know, this is, uh, you know, where you can apply for a job and avoid these people. Like, <laughs> it, that's what it feels like. Do you think so, it's going to make a difference? I mean, if you were speaking of representation, do you think do you think representation makes uh, do you think the, like the existence of Kamala Harris in the VP role? And let's I be real. So. The VP role is not the presidential role. The VP, I think everyone just forgot about Dan Quayle pretty much for a while. I saw him actually at the inauguration. I was like, oh my God. Oh, yeah. He looks, he looks exactly the same. He has not, he had, looks exactly. Other people are like, wow, you're 10 years older than when I last saw you. But he <laughs> looks exactly the same. He is aging nicely. But I had completely forgotten about that man. The only thing you, I think about when I think of Dan Quayle is, oh, the potato guy. Can't, yes. That's it. Yeah, um, that's it. I hope it makes a difference. I think about it making a difference in, in, in my community because now you have someone who is the most powerful, in the most powerful position that a South Asian has ever been in this country. And they are black and they're Indian and they're the children of two immigrants. And I want I want that to mean something for the elders in our community, for all the things you told us and said to us. Here's an example of a woman that's both in all your fears and your bigotry, like how misplaced that is. Because to me, it's like it's that that union, I'm sure, must have caused some friction. I'm sure that wasn't easy for both of her parents, considering, you know, the the, the potential uh, you know, issues with between communities. I think it's, you know, I think in that way, I think it's incredibly important from a community perspective. But I wonder, though, I wonder nationally, because I don't even think people think about the Indian part. I mean, I don't even think Indians well, always think about it. I do. I mean, I just think she's like, like, she's a lot of firsts. Right. Right. But, so like, wow, first woman, first Indian, first black First but do you woman, think about the Indian, Indian part? part. <laughs> I mean, do you think about the Indian part immediately when you think of her? Do you think? It's, I, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm maybe not your average because I just like read stories about her all the time and sure. and, and I've read out loud, so I, I'm probably you know sort of more. Yeah, I guess I'm that person though. I, I really am that person who goes into events and counts people, and I go into events and I try to kind of see what like the demographics of people. So. I might not be your average person on, on that front. I'm kind of obsessed with it. But I always wonder. I remember when Obama was elected, there were like smart black people who said to me, now racism is finally over. And I'm like, oh, no. I think you're high. I literally think you're insane and also no. crazy and also wrong, but also mostly wrong. And 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 those people, like, obviously, sadly, I was right. And sadly, they were very wrong. But like smart, bold faced name people that, you know, and I'm not going to mention their names, uh, who really thought like, oh, my God, this is it. America has done this thing. And it's amazing. And now we're on the other side of racial healing. And I was just I remember my best friend at the time said like, oh, shit, some stuff's going to come. She had no idea. Like, I don't think any of us had any idea like what the 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 backlash would be because the backlash obviously was a has been the last four years uh but but i remember like i was much more in the mindset of mm, this is going to be bad versus like yay we've defeated racism you know i was 20 i think 25 when he was elected and you know you 25 in 2008 yeah i'm 38 now yeah oh my god what literally i could be your mother Technically, literally, I could be your mother. Just go ahead, carry on. <laughs> I'm still 38, <laughs> and I, I still have a child. So you know, like, <laughs> keep that in mind. No, but. but there's like, I just, I don't know why I always think everybody's my age. I literally think everybody's my age, and then I'm always disappointed when I was like, oh yeah, wow, huh? Okay, yes. 
So yes, we were a, a baby in babe in arms when he was elected. Carry on. So you know, I think you know, I certainly had unrealistic, I certainly had unrealistic expectations. You know, like the possibility of universal health care, the you know, the possibility of you know, uh, just just everything just functioning just so much more smoothly. But even with that idealism, I didn't think racism was over because it wasn't a shutout. He didn't have a clean sweep. There were still millions of people who voted against him because he was black. You know, like there was I always found that so strange because it's like there like it, it's a, it's like it's a it's system. Systems don't disappear because of the symbol. Right. Like that's just changing a face doesn't change everything that's underneath it. And and, and, we, and we saw that. I think what is different, though particularly because of Kamala Harris, is that generation that grew up with Obama as a president, there's a generation of kids who saw a black president. That's where the impact is. And there's going to be a generation of, of young women of color that see Kamala Harris. To me, the impact is always with young people. I feel like with adults, it's it's hard because you get certain things get instilled. Like, you know, there's a certain post 9-11 mindset that I have, I don't think will ever go away. Mm. There's a part of me that still, you know, worries about having a beard. There's a part of me that is is constantly when I see an American flag, I assume there's going to be a hate crime. Like there's still this these gut things that don't go away when you're young. You know, that's still being built. So the idea it was immediately going to go away is foolish, but it at least showed a whole generation of people uh, that it's possible that this is a person to look up to. And I think also important, this is what happens when a black person is in power, Donald Trump. And so I think it's important for that generation to also see how racism looks and people not being, it wasn't, the story wasn't, he made it, racism's over. He made it. Racism is even worse now. And, and I don't mean that like I mean that like front facing racism. The system is the system. I'm talking about front facing. I'm going to be racist to your face. I'm going to carry a tiki torch. You know, I'm going to destroy the capital, assume that nothing's going to happen. Like, I think it's important for a generation to see that. So that's where I see I see progress. I remember my daughter uh now in college was six when Obama was elected and um and she said to me she's such a funny kid and she said so I said yeah he's the first black president and she's like the first I said yeah she goes he's the first <laughs> yeah he's the first she goes well how many girls have been president oh no <laughs> I'm like well, Cecilia, you probably should sit down for this. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> just because it was like, you know, they were they were learning about it, you know, election year kind of in school. And just this idea of like, I mean, it was so interesting to watch somebody really for the first time realize that that oh. none, no girls, zero girls, zero girls have been involved. And at that age is when they start having like girls teams and boys teams and the girls yeah. the boys and the girls can do what the boys can. It was pretty crazy. Why did you guys stop doing your your podcast three years ago? Why did you take three years off from your your um your uh, uh politically reactive? I podcast? mean, Kamau and I were planning only to do like we're planning we were planning to do it only for a year. It was going to so be it like wasn't, it didn't stop. I I thought maybe it was like Trump came in and you were like I just can't. I'm done. I'm out. No, no, we were supposed to do it for Mike and stormed out in a very dramatic. It was <laughs> that would have been mean. Sorry. I'm <laughs> no, no. I mean, if anything, it made it it made us cling to the podcast longer because we needed each other. We needed some way to get through this. And we needed the people who were listening to actually like, you know, like it's cathartic for us to make it and know people get it. It's not just cathartic for the listener. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, we were planning to do it. I'm like, oh, this is great. We'll follow the Hillary election and it'll be this historic moment and it'll be a really fascinating podcast and we can start talking about the progressive issues we'd like to see get pushed further. And, you know, like we had Obama, now we'll have another four years of a Democrat. What could that mean? We have to push even harder than we did before. Um, and instead Trump won. And so all of a sudden, you know, we found ourselves having to deal with that. And did there was you a- think he might win? I knew he was gonna win. I, you know, and I told did my- you? 
I literally, we have a house that's like 90 minutes north of uh, New York City, and so north of Westchester. And we had so many, and so many like lawn signs. So this is 90 minutes outside of New York City. I mean, we're not like in the hinterlands, you know, in New York. And, uh, and I said to him, he's going to win. And he's like, no, never. They'll never do it. No one would ever elect. I said to him, you, he's white. And I said, you discount the appeal of racism. And I'm looking at these lawn signs and I am telling you he's going to win. And if I, we had such a, like a very specific conversation about it to this day. He's like, I remember that day you told me that. And I thought you were nuts. <laughs> I, you know what? I didn't discount. I certainly didn't think he was going to win the week of, I started to suspect, oh, brother, these poll numbers aren't good. I know how you're spinning them, but I don't feel good about this. And these rallies aren't, they're getting bigger. Um, I really didn't think he was he was going to win. And it wasn't that I discounted racism. It's that I just didn't think the country could be swindled so broadly because it wasn't like a candidate who like, you know, it wasn't Jeb Bush. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it, it was it, it was this it was clearly it was a, it was a TV personality. He was like, so pissed, Jeb Bush. I ran into him at an event in the middle of that campaign. And he was bullshit about CNN the way, you know, because CNN would do a couple of things, right? Trump always was in the middle of all the debates. Yes. They made him the star. And he's like, it's unfair. It's unfair how we're all, you know, because it was such a massive group of people. And he's like, it's just not, you know, the way this is being done. It's like a TV event versus uh, an election, which that's what yeah. they've really become. But boy, he was just absolutely pissed. I mean, my God, you were talking about Jeb Bush, right? Yeah. Oh my God! Well, he also got trashed. I mean, it's weird to be bullied nationally as a presidential candidate. Like it, it was bizarre. Like he was bullying that man, which and you know, and, and it's funny because if if you told me another time that would upset me, I'm like, oh, wait, bully the Republican candidate? That sounds funny. But then when you see like, oh, this guy's a maniac. This guy absolutely, like, you see how he treats people. Like if he's willing to treat people like this nationally in front of other people nationally? What is he doing privately? Like this, he's, he's a monster. I, I never thought I'd feel bad for Jeb Bush, but there was a part of me that was like, yeah, you know, 10 year old nerd that really took it a little hard. Like, my God, like this is a human being. He has kids watching. How can you say this? Mm. Yeah, so I, I I I really wish you guys had been around for the last couple of years because I could have used the cathartic. <laughs> I mean, we came back. I think well, another reason why we left was it was just so much work, and and, and the yeah. show was good partly because we put so much work into it, and and there was a lot of research and heart put into it, and so it was just between you know Kamau's schedule with the, with you know United Shades of America and with my touring and shooting stuff like it wasn't gonna sh shoot shooting television things like a special and things like that just right. want to clarify what i was shooting <laughs> um <laughs> but um it, it was hard oh. and i think there were so many messages from people who wanted it back more I'm than so we glad ever brought it back especially at show like at shows kamal was telling me it's like i have a tv show and people were coming up to me to talk about the podcast I had two years ago. And I have a TV show. You would think they would ask me about that. They yeah. all wanted to know about the podcast. And I had similar experiences. So it was clear that, like, this wasn't just a thing people had that, you know, they were washing dishes and they had something to listen to. This meant something. And it still means something. And that's why we came back. Like, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And we love each other's company. And being able to discover the world together oh, in a way romance. oh my god what's it, a beautiful he's, thing we love each other's company no, it's great <laughs> you I know he's it. he's he's one of my best friends he's a, a he's mentor a he's, he's he's you know and also you know in terms of it's funny like at some point we both talked about just like you know he's a black guy and i'm an indian guy and and that particular combination of friendship you don't see very often in in a public space um, and we I know that TV show, although sometimes I'm afraid for him when he's confronting people. I'm like, oh, don't do it. Come out, don't yeah. Do it. Yeah. And then, then I'm like, producer. that's what producers are for. They do the heavy lifting. And then I think, oh, this is what three kids will make you do. <laughs> like, this is what you're willing to do to keep this, this, the going is, you know, I have one, I have a five month old now. I, sir, I, I, I'm not at the point of confronting the Ku Klux Klan. Nope. Uh, nope, nope. 
But give me another one. We'll see. Maybe, yeah, I, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll meet yeah, up with the like, Proud Boys. You know a small crying baby is harder than anything else you could possibly do in <laughs> a, 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 a camera crew. Yeah. That's so interesting. You know, are you finding that conversations about race and racism in the wake of the George Floyd killing? Um, are you, are you fine? Like I'm finding a lot of corporations have me come in and sometimes moderate conversations or just sure. do Q and a around, you know, projects I'm working on, on TV. And, um, and I really, I mean, maybe I'm, 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 I'm a realist, but I'm also an optimist. And I sometimes feel like, wow, these are really different conversations we're having now for, for some corporate, right? Usually corporate is like, so don't say anything and yeah. kind of, you know, we like to be right down the middle and, you know, you just talk about yourself. And, and now everyone's like, we want to have the tough conversations and we understand that these are going to be difficult conversations and we want, you know, and I, I'm, I, I, I have seen a real difference. Are you noticed? Are you seeing that too? Or is it, you think it's a, a, yes. a real thing? And it's very like strange. Life? It's very strange. Like to me, honestly, like I, cause I've met enough well-intentioned white liberals who, you know, want to talk about it, but certainly they have certain boundaries and discomforts. But now it's not just white liberals. I feel like there's, there are people that were so disgusted by what they saw, which is amazing to me because there's been so many, but something about the image hands of- in the uh, pockets. Hand hands in the pockets. Everyone says to me, it was the hands in the pockets. Also, well, the, him, the also cry, I also hear crying for his mama. I mm. think crying for his mother, like that, the human, the humanity, like you don't get to see the humanity of the victim very often, right? Like all you, all you see is they must have done something. You rarely get to see, like that. His humanity was very clear because we saw him slowly die and the things he was yelling out. And I, I think that it's like, I think people knew. Like you knew how bad it was to some degree. People knew. I don't but think it's... everybody knew. I mean, I'm always surprised because I knew. I mean, I, I literally, I had a bunch of people, maybe a dozen people, and a bunch of them white, middle aged dudes, and they would say to me, you know, I just, I, I'm, and they're liberal guys, you know, and they would say, you know, I just never. I, I never I thought that these guys who were getting caught or whatever were were like they're not Girl Scouts, right? Maybe they hadn't done this exact thing, but but you probably got somebody who was not a very good person off the streets in some capacity, right? And and if the guy ran, he was running because he had done something bad. And if you know, then and again, I'm not justifying it. Sure, sure. Their honest takes on like I'm a good person and I don't see color, but blah 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 blah. And they were shocked and they were like, I just cannot believe it i and now now i'm rethinking like how many of the people are like this dude and i remember <laughs> thinking my first thought then this is an indication that i'm small and petty because i was like do you know how many freaking documentaries i've done <laughs> like you've right, obviously right, 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 right. not a one <laughs> so you call yourself my friend and you've watched none of my documentaries that was my first thought <laughs> but afterwards it was like i sort of got you know i i was both glad that that was a moment for them but it did it was like oh my god there have been so many like this one did you know hold on another week there'll be a couple more i mean that's 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 why i have a tough time believing that they really didn't know it was bad i mean there's been enough over the last decade that you know like you have rodney king and then all of a sudden a stream of videos over the last like decade right you yeah, know but like I think they would say well you don't know what's happening at the beginning and listen, a cop is a tough job and, you know, none of you would admit. And I listen, I wouldn't do that job. I think that would be hard and scary and, and total. All of those things are correct. Um, but I, I you know, I, I, I think that they've always sort of posed it as it's tough and you just don't know. And the guy and what would you do if someone did that? So I I think that that's the land that they've lived in. And this this was a big change for them. Like this was the first time. And they said, you know, the hands in the pockets was the thing. Like he's killing the guy without bothering to take his hands out of his pockets. I, it, it definitely had an impact on people like that. Well, it, did, do you feel like it, it 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 wasn't just that one incident? That one incident all of a sudden made them rethink all the other incidents? Because otherwise uh, they could just say it's one bad apple again, right? Yeah, but you know what? It was followed by all these protests. And in the protests, the police, I thought, were so often so poorly behaved. The little old man who falls, you can see blood oh, running out of God. his head. Oh, right? God, yeah, and, in Buffalo, and, right? And, 
the cop, so one cop leans down to help him, right? And the guy behind him shoves him and is like, don't do it. No. You know, and so I think my husband would say, like, I just, you know, as much as you, someone will say, yeah, well, it's just a bad apple. And then, and then, you know, today we've got three more examples and tomorrow there's three more examples and five yeah. more examples of just this really terrible people being beaten. I, I think it was that. I think it was this, this sort of very stressful reckoning that, that people had. And it was the first time that I felt like white people really got it. I, I think, I mean, maybe it goes away, but I, I, I just hadn't kind of sensed that before. I think a lot about that Chris Rock joke. I think it's from maybe his second special, Bigger and Blacker. Um, but he, he talks about like how racism, you know, s still exists. And, and the way it looks and he's like you could be i'm going to paraphrase and I, I hate doing this to comics but um you could be like a poor you could be like a, a one-legged poor white janitor and you wouldn't switch places with me and i'm rich <laughs> and i feel i think about that like it, it's like people know i think intrinsically that they're in a position of advantage because i don't think people would want to deal with black people what black people deal with i think it's I think I think some of it is kind of known. I mean, just the fact that people are like every I'm look. I have a tough time thinking. So you're staring at this guy. You're crossing the street because this black guy is near you. You're like you hear what people say about that group of people. You must know on some level that to be black is to be like treated in this way because you're treating people in that way. And the people you know are treating people in that way. Doesn't that like tell you, OK, there is racism. This is unfair. Or is are people so like in their own asses that they are like they they don't even see that as racist, but just simply like, well, like it's the truth. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I think that in America, talking about racism is worse than being racist. Yeah, I think people really I mean, right. I think it's I think it's a very I, but I do I do definitely feel like things are changing. I did an interview with a guy, his company had hired me to come in and, and chat with some of their employees, moderate a conversation. Sure. And there was an executive, super like handsome, friendly dude, big guy, black guy, and uh, very successful. So high ranking executive. And I remember he told this story, it was probably 10,000 people in his company. And he said, um, he said, I'm going to tell you, everybody was asked to like bring a story. So he told this story and his story sort of went like, I heard a noise down in my basement. So I go downstairs, I get down there and the back door is open. He said, and I st stood there thinking, do I call the cops because I think someone's broken into my house or do I just close the door and go back to bed? He hmm. said, I stood there for a little bit and I closed the door and I went back to bed because I thought wow. if I call the cops to come to my house at night, there's a very good chance they're going to kill me. And it was so emotional. And I really thought for the first time that his colleague, like it was there and, and because they know him and they love him, right? They think of him as nothing like George Floyd. They, they could not believe like this was his reality. And then he goes on to tell them, he's a very friendly guy. He said, you know how I know the names of all the people at the front desk and the guy who swipes your, your badge, I know his name. He said, you know why? Because one day I'm gonna come in in sweats and I'm gonna need people to vouch for me. You know, so it's like this whole thing about being friendly was just a strategy for survival, literally. And I, I think it was so eye-opening for people in his company who were just like, holy shit, you, you wouldn't call the cops? You think you're going to back to bed? You think someone might have broken into your house, but you'd rather just risk it and go back to bed? Right. You have more of a fighting chance with the prowler than the police. Unbelievable. And I, it really, I think it really moved people to have some of these conversations that I think are are happening. I mean, maybe not everywhere, but I, I think some of them are really are happening. I mean, I, you, you mentioned that that incident, I think it was in Buffalo with the old man who's mm -hmm. pushed down by the police and his head's <laughs> cracked open. And, and then one of the cops wants, I mean, because all of a sudden his humanity came out like, oh, my God. And it's like, no, just keep going. You know, it's I think stuff like that. It's like, you know, Hannah Arendt wrote that that book about the banality of evil. And it's like, that's an exact, that's like the perfect example. Like his humanity is there, right? It's like, I, uh, what just happened to this man? We got to do something. I can't believe this happened. And then immediately it's like, I'm just doing my job. Right. I'm doing my job right now. This is my job. This is part of the job. 
like it, you see all that happen within seconds and you know to me like that video is 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 maybe not as powerful obviously as, as the police brutality videos but it's incredibly powerful because you actually see almost everything that's wrong just in a matter of seconds right just and in a matter of seconds man, he literally is hobbling through he's not yeah. you know it's it, it that's it, again i think all those things happen one right after the other why why do you think these this idea of um of unity. I mean, I, it's it's actually kind of a brilliant strategy by Republicans in a yes. lot of ways, I think, yeah. because they kind of glommed onto a, a phrase of Joe Biden's in a perfectly nice inauguration speech, right? As speeches yeah. go, it's not the greatest, it's not the worst, it's kind of fine. But uh, it's like unity. Well, I, I guess impeachment's not unity. I guess holding people accountable for an insurrection in the Capitol well, is not exactly unity. It's 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 it, from a marketing standpoint or a strategy. Pick the word, hammer it, hammer it, hammer it, hammer it. I, I guess it makes sense. It's just I, like honestly, as uh, a person living in this country, I don't care about how you deal with your coworkers. You know, I want the job to get done. I don't care about the relationships you have with people and whether you're arguing less. I want to see results. And so, to me, just the whole idea of unity is is like. What does that mean? You're not. I want functionality. Right. You know, I, I want I want civility. I want things to get done. I want like whether that be the most basic like covid money like that seems that like, people getting a check. That's basic stuff. The idea that like the federal government shouldn't shut down because you guys couldn't get your stuff together like that's basic stuff. Right. Then I have the stuff like I, I would dream of like a like the best healthcare system possible and like you know the like the steady destruction of the prison industrial complex and what we can do to like end like this school to prison pipeline these are things that you know I want to see to me I I don't need all the republicans to agree <laughs> I don't need that what is the fear that if well if we use our power now then it's going to when they have power back, they're going to they already did. Do we not remember the last four years? It wasn't even just like, oh, we have a slight. We have the House and the Senate. It wasn't even that. It was just a president with executive orders who did also who did whatever he wanted, ran roughshod over the place. And meanwhile, the Democrats are like, but the rules, though, and we don't want to set a bad example. I just I hate the idea of like decorum having more value than people's rights and their dignity and survival. I don't care. I mean, I, decorum is important. Like you shouldn't charge into the Capitol and try to kill representatives. OK, <laughs> there. I mean, I got a bar, but at the end of like, I don't like I just want y'all to get stuff done and have real discussions and actually hear from your constituents and the idea of a filibuster like not like have this kind of like a system that where you don't even have a reasonable debate where there's ways to change rules so you have to have 60 vote i don't i want this to work like a democracy that's what people are asking but who's asking like i'm never like god i wish the republicans and democrats would stop fighting they're not my parents <laughs> like I, I don't, I don't care if they stay together. This doesn't have it. This doesn't it. That doesn't bother me. I want things to get done. And also, when they are unified, like for example, with like Clinton's presidency, with Bill Clinton's presidency, they did all sorts of terrible things. Clinton was all about centrism. There was tons of like what blue dog Democrats. There was like it was awful. They did like the crime bills that were passed during that time. I don't need them to be on the like we we compromised our values and the lives of this many people. I don't need that kind of unity. I want idealism and I want practicality with you, those two things aren't separate. You can be idealistic and you can be practical. I think the Green New Deal is an example of that. We are all going to die because of climate change. Yeah, we don't have we need a new industry. This is a new industry in a time of great unemployment and job. This is what we need. That's practicality and idealism. 
is it going to be easier to be a comedian in this years ahead, next couple of years? Or, or did you, I, I mean, I, I, I think even just as an audience for comedy, I really struggled over the last couple of years because I, nothing was really funny to me. I mean, right. I, I, we used to get so mad about, um, Chris Eliza, who writes for CNN, because he would write these stupid columns, and they're really just inane. But 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 they were often like, if you cared that there were brown kids in cages, you wouldn't think it was so amusing to write Trump is like a reality show, right? Because you'd be like, well, this is a really witty thing, but you know, this horrible thing is happening over here, so maybe tonally this doesn't work. And I I used to be so mad, like I just was mad all the time. Um, because it just seemed to me so many of the reporters were kind of missing a lot of the horrible things that were unfolding and and kind of playing into this the wacky Trump and maybe he's too stupid to even understand that he's president and and look at these words he's misspelled and you're like there's a lot of bad shit going on and you guys are really who, whose jobs it is to monitor this and report on it that's not my job that's not what I do uh, I, I just was very disheartening for me do you think now with him gone ish sort of whatever he's doing for the moment um it makes it easier as a comedian i mean i guess wait so the the thing that um your colleague said was that like he was my it, colleague merciful god so he chris oh. elizabeth wrote he if you go back and look at his columns in the middle of trump probably in the first or second year he would write a lot about like he loved having this wacky i only way i can call it wacky sense of you donald yeah. trump is like a reality show you know, and you're, and he'd go through all these ways and you're like, well, actually, if you knew anything about producing a reality show, you'd realize the end's already written, right? Yes, nothing in reality shows are nothing like you. So one, you, one, you're just completely fucking wrong, but two, right. like you're making light of a guy. Uh, what are the, the greatest nicknames for people? And you're like, okay, but this is disgusting actually that we, right, we right, call right. elected officials who deserve, whether you like them or not, some kind of respect. I don't think it's funny. I just don't find the nickname thing funny. Um, if if Democrats were Game of Thrones characters, who would they be? Nancy Pelosi yeah. would be. You're like, oh my God, there's your job, really. Like, it's just, it would be fine if he were a comedian. I'd be like, okay, well, he's not very good, right. but he's trying. But like, right, right. he's not a comedian. <laughs> right, right, right. Right, that's, that's a bad journalism, guy. right. Yeah. Right, and, and it was so distressing because it was kind of like, I don't really give a shit about these brown kids who are in cages and I don't care about this ban over here. I don't care about this thing that's been done. That's so, yeah. that's so mean and upsetting and horrific and disgusting. You know, it literally to me was the not saying anybody's Hitler, but yeah. the kind of like, you know, but, but do we really give Hitler credit for loving bunnies? I don't know that we do. Right, I right, right, right. For being a vegetarian. <laughs> right. Um, um, you know, I, I, I don't, one thing that will be easier is that, Satire was really difficult to create under Trump because mm -hmm. any extreme example you could come up with, he's topped in reality. His tweets are a work of like satirical genius, but they're real. Like the, him as a figure, as a character, what does that say about society? Like it, it's hard to like top that. So in that way, uh, I think, you know, we're probably one, we're, we're all better off. Uh, also, um, you know, there was also great comedy that was happening during, you know, the Trump era that was very critical that did, you know, I think to me, comedy is a survival mechanism, right? It also has an evolutionary benefit because why else is it still around? Like what, what, it doesn't help us get food. Well, me, it does. That's my job. But like, generally speaking, it doesn't have like, you know, why do we have this? And it's because we won't be able to deal with reality without it. So I think, it, you know, comedy was incredibly important especially the stuff that was able to, you know, um, call it like truth to power, you know. Um, so now I do think it's it's easier in that, you know, this maniac is gone. And so you can get back to satire. It's harder, I think, because people love the high of him being gone. And so to make art that is critical, I think, you know, politically, I worry a little bit, you know, even though there's still a lot, of, there's still the movements aren't dead, people are still fighting, and there's going to still be marches, like, I believe that, but a, a part of me worries that in a mainstream way, whether people are burnt out from it, because of Trump. And it bothers, and that bugs me, because it's like, Trump wasn't really the problem, he was the 
he was, you know, the result of a lot of problems we already had. He took advantage of cracks in the system. And so I think that's one thing that I think makes it harder is I hope people still have the appetite for funny truth. Um, so the answer to your question is I don't know. I think I think it could, I, I see it both ways. Also, we have COVID, so we have COVID, yeah. so I, I don't I won't need to deal with it for at least two more years. Exactly. No one's <laughs> making their albums. I'm not touring. Yeah. <laughs>